Well, welcome to episode two of uh, season one, I suppose, of Perspectives of Pedagogy, a teacher's roundtable. Um, that is assuming, of course, that we survive to make a season two. Um, the higher ups on the network might uh, pull our show for its lack of engaging content. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, they have to wait till season two, kind of like Star Trek. Exactly. You gotta, yeah. you gotta, you gotta get your your data in. You gotta know, you know, all the views and the ratings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Kill off um, the unlikable characters. Yes. <laughs> so I guess it's just gonna be you, buddy, in season oh, two. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, today we are talking about um, the end of year one, um, or really, I guess, everything that happens in between. Uh, the first lesson in the end of year one. Our last episode was on what do we want to accomplish in the first lesson. And so we're going to talk about what we want to accomplish in the first year. Um, as a reminder, my name is Reese Bergen. I teach in the Houston area. I am a professor of music at Lone Star College Montgomery and just recently also at Lone Star College SciFair, um, which is also in the Houston area. Uh, in addition to that, I teach um, probably about 50 to 60 students um, outside of the college on a weekly basis. And I sleep at some point. <laughs> and I'm Alex Singleton. I am the professor of saxophone at Chattanooga State um, and Covenant College in the Chattanooga area. And I maintain uh, not quite as large of a private studio as my Texas friend here, Reese. Um, and on the side, I do a lot of repair work, um, specializing in very high-end restorations and overhauls. So. Yeah, man. Two different perspectives, two different demographs. Let's see what we got after year one. All right. Well, I'll, I'll go first. Um, uh, I think, and this is an overarching theme for me, no matter what year um, or level of student I'm, I'm teaching, uh, the tone has got to be there. Um, my, I tell students all the time, nobody cares how fast you're playing. If you don't sound good, nobody wants to listen. Right. Um, and so the first, you know, in, in saxophone world, um, my goal by the end of year one is that they know, in terms of tone, is they know how to practice the mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. And they know why they practice the mouthpiece. Right. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. I, I, no, no, no. It's, it's fine. I, the, the mouthpiece is a really interesting subject for me because, I mean, we, we never really set it down. Um, and and the, the word why is important. You know, I tell all of my students that I'm not, I'm never going to tell you something that I want you to do unless I can explain to you in detail why. At multiple different levels, like if it's middle school, I'm not going to tell them that like overtone series is for blah, 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 blah. Like this is, this is going to help you, you know, gain control of your instrument, very rudimentary levels. And as they grow, the explanations kind of grow with them. But the mouthpiece is, it's really important. And I, that's like one of the things that I start them on, you know. Um, but I have a curveball to throw at you. I have a curveball to throw at you. I'm ready. So what would be the difference between the perspective of year one versus the, or, or making like a broad category of middle school player? Meaning like what would you, what is the difference that you expect from your students after the first year versus just middle school in general? That is a, that is a good question. Um, I expect uh, actually, uh, hang on, uh, let me explain why I'm asking you this, okay? Because, I mean, we obviously teach in two very, very, very different places, and the students that we pull in are radically different, you know, just cultural thing, you know, bands, the, the band programs in Texas are just amazing. And that's not to say that they're good here, but it's just a whole nother level with Texas, right? Um, I find that the, the band directors that call me in to work with their students, the, the, they have this, they have a very specific thing that they want me to work with their students on, and I find that it's easier for me and the student when I when I tailor the 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 mindset of lessons to be a middle school saxophone lesson versus a seventh grade saxophone lesson. Does that does that make sense? So I'm, I'm curious to see what what your what your opinion is on that. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, and we're gonna in order for me to answer that question, I'm gonna branch out beyond just talking about mouthpiece, but. Um, yeah, I have like a checklist of things that I want to accomplish uh, by the end of year one. Um, now, realistically, how often do, do do I get to check off every box? 
uh, maybe one out of every 20 students. Um, you know, and so, so yeah, I mean, I look at, I look at high school and middle school students differently. Um, uh, but I don't look at, uh, I don't, I don't really delineate between, um, like a seventh grader and a middle schooler. Right. Now, now in total fairness, I actually teach in a three tiered system. So we have intermediates that feed to junior highs that then feed to high schools. I have one school that's like that. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Those yeah. Very, very strange kind of situation. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, yeah. Um, so my whole thing is like by year one, I want you to do X, Y, Z. And then when, you know, 90% of students don't, then they have another year to complete it. And so right. my, my year one is really more like by your third year of playing saxophone, you should be able to do this. Um, and, and so let me, let me run down my list so that you'll understand why it usually doesn't take them, it takes them more than a year. So there's okay. mouthpiece pitch, right? First of all, we gotta get A, right? Now, or at least not as close- Not B? No, not B. Uh, or at least as close as we can, because I feel like, I feel like a, a lot of these, you know, I'm dealing with fifth graders usually for the first year. Their heads are not that big. So for them to get an A, is they have to open up way more than I do. I got a big mouth, Alex, you know that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so I'm a little flexible on that. I'm like, okay, we wanna get A, if you get B flat, I'm not gonna like throw a fit about that until we get to high school. Um, so there's the mouthpiece pitch. I have technical goals. I want, them, I want them to know all 12 of their scales. I want them to at least be starting their arpeggios, if not have already finished them. Okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask you, on, well, on the subject of, hang on, mouthpiece pitch, scales okay i'm making notes because i want to ask you back some questions after you get through here okay? yeah sure yep uh chromatic scale um articulation exercises and yeah that's that's pretty much the big four things and i think wrapped up with tone exercises also you know, long tones and octave exercises, Remingtons, those sorts of things. Okay, so let me let me start off with this question. Do you do anything outside of those things to keep your students interested? I think the interest that I create in my lessons is less to do with the content and more with the delivery. Um, so I, even at, as, as long as the student and not every student can, can handle that, but you know, as long as, as long as the student is of like the, if they have the psychology to where we can laugh and joke around and talk about Dr. Strange and then be like, okay, play scales. Um, that's how I'm able to maintain that. Um, you know, uh, I rarely work on band music and lessons. I, Almost I, I, never. That's a that's a conversation that I have very regularly with parents because a lot of I think that we kind of touched on this during the last one is a, a lot of the parents that that come to me seeking out lessons they are they're very very worried about their student in band mm -hmm. and they want it's it's like they want me to practice their band music for the kid you know show like literally spoon feed them the band music right and I and I sit them down at the beginning and I say look I'm not going to do that. You know, but all the things that I'm going to coach you through will allow the, you know, your your child to, you know, successfully, you know, chew and digest this music that their band directors are giving them, you know, because I don't like working more than I have to, as, right. as most people do, and we shouldn't have to. We have to teach the kids on how to do that work, you know. So I think that my lessons are they're they're structured not only about how to be an efficient musician, but how to develop a work ethic, and that's kind of a touchy subject sometimes with, with, with parents. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing the my, my line, I guess my sales pitch with that is if you, if your student does everything I ask them to do, they'll never have to practice band music again. Yep. Yeah. And, and with the kids, when, uh, my favorite metaphor, when they come into a lesson and they haven't practiced and blah, 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 
is, you know, I say, I want you to, I, I tell them, I want you to imagine that I am a chef and you, you've asked me to make you dinner and you show up with like salt and flour and that's it. Ooh, I like Are that. you going to like your dinner? <laughs> and they go, no. I'm like, yeah, that's because you didn't give me anything to work with. Yeah. And, I like that. Yeah, the analogy, nine, the analogy that I've been using, I stole from Jessica Dodge. Okay. I think that I think that I said this last week. I'm Home Depot. You know, I have yeah. all the tools and all the knowledge that you need, but it's up to you to take the materials and build a house. Yeah. You know, but same I actually, concept. I, I, it's the same concept, but I think that I like yours better. You know, because it implies that they are interacting with you. Right. You know, I'm your personal chef. You are hiring me to do a service for you. You know, but I can only work with the ingredients that you have in your house. I'm not yeah. responsible for bringing the, the ingredients. All I'm responsible for is working with you for what you bring to my table. Right. I like that. I like that a lot. Steal That's it, really man. good stuff. I'm, I will. Yeah, you don't have to tell no because if you tell me that I can steal it, I'm not really stealing it. I'm taking it, you know. Okay, that's fine. Well, I, I'm giving this to you, Alex. There you go. Lovely. I, I'm, I'm happy to take it. Okay, so how do you handle mouthpiece pitch when students bring it to you above or below the pitch? Well, because first, I do have students that bring it way below the pitch, like F. Yeah, yeah. And, but that's and, like 10, 15 percent of the time, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I was gonna, I was just gonna say, like, like 90 percent of the time, it's C. First mm -hmm. try. Yeah. Um, so, gosh, um, you know, so the the thing that that first of all, and I, I'm sure it's like this on other instruments. I'm just not as sensitive to it. But I honestly don't know sometimes how students are able to make the saxophone do th the things. They're not doing it on purpose, you know, but like, you know, you, you have a beginner. You're like, okay, play a B. And they go honk and it's a G. <laughs> and you're like, how are you doing? <laughs> like, I know that it that it's something with you're probably too low in your tongue boost, but like, I didn't think that was like physically possible kind of thing. Um, so, ninety percent of the time, the player in me is like, I need to try this. I'm like, don't right? turn around and pick up my saxophone. I've, I'm yeah. not, I'm not kidding. Like, so, like, and sometimes I, I do. Sometimes in lessons, I do get stumped because I don't know if it's like a jaw thing or a tongue thing, and I'll try to recreate their sound, like in the lesson. I do that too. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's something I think <laughs> that. I mean, the voice, it's just one of the other things that we never think is important about us doing voicing practice because, you know, to, to figure out what they're doing on the spot due to our flexibility is, it's almost like a superpower that, right. you know, you yeah. develop through, you know, all of this fundamental stuff. But yeah. yeah, but speaking more specifically, 90% of the time they are too tight and it has everything to do usually with this right here. Yeah. B because... Because, and here's my personal theory on you're this. Not, is there video to this? Because I think it's important that they know that, they, that you're pointing to your chin. I am, yeah, there is video, yes. Okay, okay, everything, okay. Is, everything is video. I am pointing to my chin. Um, but uh, I, have, I have a theory on this, and I have zero data to back it up, ex other than my own thoughts and logic. Um, my, my philosophy on, on this phenomenon is that, you know, Roughly speaking, you can you can break down your muscles in your face and your head. There are vertical muscles and there are horizontal muscles. All right. So the muscles responsible for opening and closing your jaw are incredibly strong. We chew, we talk, and this is the thing that always makes students go, oh, is when you are at rest, when you are completely relaxed, your jaw is closed. That is what your body does. Now consider that, just like you and I are doing right now, we're sitting up, your, your jaw muscles are so strong that they are counteracting the Earth's gravity and you don't even notice it. And the jaw is not unheavy. <laughs> it's, it's not, not it's a bone, yeah. So these muscles that, are, that go up and down, nom, 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 very strong. Now the, now the muscles that go left and right for your lips they move a little bit when you talk, mm -hmm. when you smile or frown, and they keep your lips on your face. Mm -hmm. They don't have a whole lot of work to do. I'm gonna so, give you. I'm gonna give you the the yang to that because I mean, I think that there's two parts. Your your theory works really well with mine, and 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 
it, it's the it's the fact that they're they're when I'm talking about tone to students at the very beginning, I tell them number one, the saxophone is a wind instrument. It is not a light breeze instrument. It is a wind instrument. And when mm -hmm. you think of wind, you're thinking of like trees whipping around. You know, it needs fuel and your air is fuel. Okay. Now what's happening a lot of the time is they're not giving it enough fuel in order to create the reaction to get the reed to vibrate. So what their natural unconscious response is, is to create a smaller opening so that the reed can be, you know, but they're doing, they're, they're listening to the feedback of the instrument like they should be doing. However, they're, they're giving it what, they're not giving it what it's asking for. And, and here's the thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you. Um, you're absolutely right, and, and it's a chicken and the egg kind of thing because yeah. they're biting too much, so they don't need as much air as they normally, as they should use. Mm -hmm. um, or, or, or are they not pushing up enough air so they bite? I don't know which one happened first. And the other, the other side, or the other aspect to what you're talking about is the feedback of the instrument. Saxophone, you cannot use the feedback of the instrument to develop a great sound because our instrument is too easy to play. It is too easy to play. Think about a clarinet. If your armature is too tight, squeak. You know, if your tongue, your tongue could be in the wrong position and it's just, it's obviously wrong, right? With a flute, if you, if your aperture isn't correct or your air is not going the right direction, it just doesn't play at all. You know, right. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have, I don't have the analogy in the brass world. I'm sure right. there are, there are minutiae I'm not aware of. But the thing on saxophone is you could play with a double lip embouchure, you know, any, <laughs> you do and any you, you kind of thing. Sound. And you, you can, can make, make a sound. sound. Yeah. And on top of that, not only just a sound, but you won't notice a problem until you're playing really low or really high because of the physics of the instrument. Right. And I think that this is, this is where I draw the line in my lessons and say, okay, I'm not going to talk about certain things until I know for a fact that a student is going to be a music major and they are, in a, they are an upperclassman in high school. And this is something where I agree with you 100%. We cannot listen to the saxophone's feedback at first. But I think that a lot of what I have built off or built my playing on is listening to the feedback of the saxophone because I have learned the language of how it communicates with me through the study of fundamentals. Right, and we're talking about year one. Right, right. I know. So just, that's, that's why is, I'm saying that. Okay, all right, yeah. 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 So um, it's, it's that line that, that we draw. You know, it's, it's the thing like in music theory, like you don't do this. Until you decide but. that you can. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right, yeah, yeah. So that's that's you know that's one of those things. So, oh yeah, and that's that's the thing is like, and that's I that's why I feel like saxophone lessons make such a huge difference is because um, there's a lot of really great band directors out there, um, but they don't all play saxophone, so they don't know. You know, right. as long as you're playing, as long as you're getting a sound out of, out of your instruments, you've got bigger fish to fry because other instruments you're not getting a sound out of. Right, and I'll I'll let me let me throw this out there. Oh, that's actually a really good point. Because the saxophone is so easy, they don't have to. That's really, that's yeah. really good. I've never thought of it that way, but yeah, that's that's very, that's a very astute observation. Okay. Pitch or volume on the mouthpiece, which is more important the first year? Um, at first, volume. Because I, I'm in agreement. Yeah. Because of what you, you talked about drop earlier. The pitch. If you're if you're not pushing enough air, you can't manipulate it. Okay. Yeah, like you said, it's a wind instrument. It's not a mouthpiece instrument. So you have to have the wind there first. And in order to do that, you have to have the, obviously, you play loud. So I don't, with very few exceptions, um, even all the way through high school, I, I tell students, ne if you're practicing mouthpiece, which you should be, never do it softly. Now, I have some advanced students where we're like, yeah, let's do tone exercise. Let's let's play as soft as we possibly can and try to get an A on the mouthpiece. You know, that way we can explore some flexibility and voicing and things like that. But that's a very advanced concept. Um, and, and in fact, at you know, even even some college students aren't ready for that. Right. So, but yeah, volume all day. Okay, I'm in, I'm 100% in agreement with you. That's that's pretty much what I preach to. 
and it only it doesn't take them that long to get the volume right, you know. But through the the, the working of the volume, we get we get the ability to change the pitch. I yeah, and that's... and the other thing is, you know, these things, um, you know, physics is a very complex thing. Like these things we're talking about don't happen independently of each other. I find that probably about half the time when I have a first year student, we're working on mouthpiece and they're like at like a B, but they're like playing soft. I say, hey, play louder. And then all of a sudden it's an A. Yeah. Because what did they have they, to they do? Have to, they have, they to, have to open the up. Space. Yeah, exactly. They have to create the space. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So scales. When you say that you have the first year student, now we, we're still talking first year. This is not the middle. Okay. All 12 major scales, one octave. What two octaves. Are, two octaves. Bum, 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 bum. Okay. Okay. Even on G? <laughs> Even on G? No, no, no. I'm so, okay, so one slash two <laughs> I'm, I'm, octaves. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure, sure. Hey, so like you know the, what? The, you the joke. Audition pattern. Yeah, you I, you oh, joke, okay. but I had, I'm not, I kid you not, I had a, uh, I had a sixth grader come into a lesson one, one day and go, Mr. Bergen, I can play a G. And I was like, yeah, that's one, two, three, duh. And he was like, no. I can play the the high G, and I was like, yeah, with the octave key. And he was like, no, the one above that. And I was like, okay, let's hear it. <laughs> and he just and goes, okay, and he goes, boop, played G, first try, no problem. I never taught him that. I was just like, good for you. That's jerk. That's that's one of. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's it's Sean Gard twenty twenty years ago. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's what happened. Okay, so chromatic scale, full range, low B flat, high F. Uh, low D to high D. Low D to high D. Now, okay. that 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 being said, if and when they accomplish that, we st we add we add the palm keys first, and then once they can do low D to high F or F sharp if it's on their saxophone. Um, once we can do that consistently, then we add the pinky keys. I wait till the very last possible moment to add those pinky keys because a lot of these kids, their pinkies they, they, are not, not long enough. Not, yeah. mm -hmm. And I, I had I, many of my students get to that point and it's like, okay, fine, let's do it wrong. And I, I'm, I don't want to wait. I'm impatient. So I actually have them take their thumb off the thumb rest and reach around. And every... Every few months or so, I'd be like, all right, let's try it the real way. And eventually we get to that point to where their hands are big enough. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, but. I try to, I've always, I've always tried to expose kids to the full range of the instrument. Palm keys, especially. But then, you know, like a full range scale, not chromatic, because I mean, the C sharp to B can, I mean, like that, I had a kid that did it one time and it like, it really messed up their fingernail because they caught it because the horn was in like a weird adjustment where the B was higher than the C and it like went under the key. Ooh. Yeah, it didn't, it wasn't good. Um, but anyway, it was, I, I'm, I like to make sure that they're exposed to like the, the full range of the instrument, knowing that they're going to have to play it one day, you know, so, um. What are you doing for your articulation exercises? What, what are those? What are we doing there? Yeah, I just do, you know, uh, pretty much a baby lay detache. Um, so th for those of us professional saxophonists in the, uh, especially in the classical sphere, we know all about that. But it's your, basically, it's your first five notes of the major scale. And then you just go up and down and you do different articulation patterns. The most basic one, of course, would be to slur everything and then do it again and tongue everything, right? But I have them do, uh, you know, dia ta ta dia ta 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 dia ta ta dia ta dia ta ta dia ta ta. Slur four tongue four tongue four slur four. Um, yeah, and you know, so depending on the student, we may not go to every articulation pattern because we got a lot of stuff to do. Um, but the but I at least have them do the the slur all tongue all. Right. Um, that's 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 pretty much. Um, now, I guess I should back up because um, we're talking about year one. Um, but uh, one of my favorite articulation exercises is one that I kind of thought up myself. Nobody ever taught this one to me. So it's, I, I find that it really helps because uh, well, I'm going to have to give you some context. This is story time now. Um, when I was in undergrad, and I'm curious to, to hear if this is something you experienced too, um, I realized and actually wasn't able to solve it until grad school, 
but I realized that I was I had a lot of really good control of my articulation in 16th notes up to about 108. Okay. And then 120 to like 132, depending on the day. Um, really great control. But there was this really weird gray area where it was like 108 to 116, 120-ish, something like that, where it was like I would randomly get like like a double, like like I would just lose control of the tongue. But you could go faster. I could go, if it was going faster, I could do it just fine. Did it was you going slower. Tongue? I did not, no. Really? I've, I've never anchor tongued in my life. Okay. I didn't even hear about that until somebody was complaining about their student anchor tonguing, and I was like, what's that? Um, <laughs> Okay. Uh, no, and the it, the problem was twofold. The problem was, first of all, my air wasn't moving correctly in the direction it needed to go. Um, so it wasn't able to really power my articulation the way it was supposed to. Okay. Um, and the other thing was, I have a, I have a southern tongue. It's very slow. It doesn't like, we like to talk <laughs> nice and slow down here in, in Houston. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so I've, you know, my tongue just doesn't like to do things. It just, you know, we're going to eat some pecan pie, and that's about it down here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I had those two things, those two problems. And this is the exercise that solved it for me. Because, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I asked many teachers, and they said, oh, you should try this, you should try this, try this. I tried all that, nothing. One day I just thought to myself, how do other musicians – gain physical control of movement. And I thought about percussionists. And the very first rudiment that they learn is the single stroke roll. Do you know what this is? I, I, like just. Yeah, it's literally just left, or it's right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. It's, it's a coordination. So they, they start slow and they gradually speed up and they gradually slow back down. That's all it is, very basic. And I thought to myself, hmm, self, what if I did that but with my tongue? Okay. And so I just, you know, and I thought it, it, this hit me when I was in grad school. And so I got in my mouthpiece and neck and every day, single stroke roll, but with articulation. And at first my articulation was like, da, 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 like it would just pop in a second gear. And, uh, over time though, I learned there was that there was this weird sort of um, gray area where the tongue has to relax. It's like, a, it's like a gear change, yeah. Yeah, the tongue has to relax so that the air can carry the tongue forward. Because if your tongue is move, if you're moving your tongue, if you're trying to move your tongue, instead of letting the tongue bounce back from the reed, then you don't have the, you're not going to be able to to do. The kind of the weird thing was I was able to do it at a fast tempo where I could just do, 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 but in that weird medium tempo where I needed my air to do it, um, yeah. So I, I had to learn that, but it, it did that helped. So I, I have students do that um, in year one. Okay. And it's it's all about developing awareness of how the tongue moves and realizing the need for your air to power the articulation at all times. Right. Now we yep. have spoken about um, we have spoken about um, the pieces of music and books that you get for your students um, to to play. Are there any standards that that you that you have exposed your first year students to? Um, I have never I've never had a first year that I actually have given like the Eccles Sonata. Right? It's all it's all out of the method books, things mm -hmm. like that. But maybe by the second year. You know, we're, we're playing Eccles, we're playing, you know, maybe if they're ridiculously gifted, the first movement of the Haydn Sonata or something like that, or a, a, the first chunk of the third movement or, you know, things um, like that. I, I'll say I've, I don't think I've ever given a first-year student, like, a standard piece of saxophone rep. Um, I'm thinking. Uh, no, never in the first year. Um, maybe... Honestly, I think the earliest I've ever given anybody something like that, like sometimes I give the Boza to seventh graders. I have uh, done that, yep. Both the Aria, them. of course. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I usually hold off on that stuff. And, and the reason is there's there's plenty of actually really good 
um, you know, non-canon, I guess you could say. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, it's, Ex- it's extended legends. universe, the legend. Right, yeah, the legends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of, I mean, there's plenty of great stuff. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't see the need to expose them to that just yet. Um, not because I'm, like, guarding the canon or I think it's, you know going to corrupt their little minds or whatever it's just there's there's <laughs> just there's just other things that are that are better i think yeah pedagogically yeah. speaking mm-hmm. yep um i have been guilty of giving them like uh solo books i think that we've spoken about this a little bit you know like a little uh, excerpts from like a star wars book you know if the kid is if they're obviously having trouble just i mean i don't practice I need you to play your horn, man. Here's the you thing. Know? So even if they're not having trouble practicing, I think songbooks are extremely valuable. Um, there's actually there's a YouTube channel that I love now that I didn't know about until one of my fifth graders this year pointed out to me. It's called, uh, oh, what's it called? Like Sax Explained or something? Saxophone Explained. Um, and it's basically Guitar Hero for saxophone. It 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 shows so so you so so here's what you see when you see the video the the sheet music is on top and it scrolls by and as and it has the the notes and the rhythms on there but that's like the top like fourth of the screen the bottom three quarters of the screen is on on the left side is uh basically like a your standard fingering chart diagram and then little bars fly across the screen and so if it's like it's an A, there's two bars, boop, and then it's like let go of the note, and then it's like D with the, with the octave key and all kinds of stuff. And I mean they and they have you know, I mean so many things, uh, you know Toto by Africa, you know the the Avengers theme, Star Wars, blah 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 blah, you know all the single ladies. I don't know if all the single ladies is on there or not, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but. You know, yeah, but it's but it's it's mainly that kind of like pop music that they already know that they already enjoy Taylor Swift, etc. And you put and, that one on there, didn't you? No, 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 no. I wish I had thought of that, man. <laughs> yeah, I would be monetizing the crap out of that. Um, but it's it's so good because it makes it fun, you know. And the first year can be really really tough because you have yeah. people like us teaching. And we're like, you know, get it done. And and there's nothing wrong with getting it done, but for, for a kid that can be, you know, it can it yeah. can be, especially when they're excited and they're like, I know that the first lesson is a drag for all my students because they, they're excited. They're like, oh, we're gonna play saxophone. And I'm like, okay, for the next 20 minutes, let's play your mouthpiece. And they're like, oh, yeah. that's not a saxophone. Uh, yeah, and, and that's, man, that's that's a struggle for me, too, because I don't want to listen to, you know, six kids in a row play mouthpiece pitch for 20 minutes. You I would do. See me, you would see, well, you know what? <laughs> if it were me, you'd see my name in the headlines of the, ne- of the next day's paper. <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> oh, like, man, I live for that bad, stuff, man. man. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure you do. I'm sure you do. But, I mean, I, I check it. I check to make sure that, they, that they've got things in the right position, but I'm not going to spend 20 minutes on it. I'm you exaggerating. Know. I wouldn't spend 20 minutes on it. There's, there's, you only, you when you only have, all worked up for nothing, man. When you only like, have 30 oh. minutes, you know. Yeah, you gotta do other, you gotta do other yeah. things. Yeah, but, but, the, but, you know, whatever those things are, the, the point is, um, you know, any way that we can make it fun along the way, I'm all for it. I don't, I really don't care what it is, as long as they're having fun. Because if they're having fun, then they'll accidentally start doing the things I'm telling them to do anyway. Yeah. So. Yep, I just, you know, we got to look at it like we're encouraging them in the right direction, I guess, you know, through whatever whatever seems to work. Um, I think that uh, the interest is, the, the, not the interest, but the point of all of this for me is, you know, try to create a, a desire to practice because there's not really a whole lot of competition where, where I am. There's a lot, or there's not, not no competition and I say competition because that's that was the only way that my teacher, when I was in in middle school and high school in this area, was able to foster the desire to practice in me because it was um, it was like there was no self motivating anything here, you know, um, which was a little bit sad. Um, 
but now you know trying to, to, to foster and grow the desire for them to practice by themselves is, is the biggest struggle here um, so I'm, I'm curious to see uh, if I can twist around a couple of things see if it'll work here but everything that you've said is is pretty much where I'm in line with some with some tiny little twists here and there you know so what are some of those twists um, the mouthpiece pitch for me is just a check I don't spend a lot of time talking about it because again I don't want a kid's parent to discourage them by saying why are you doing that all the time you know blah, blah. so I, I tell them like when you take your horn out of your case you put your tuner on the stand and play this as you know play it at a very substantial volume and at first you know I tell them like it needs to be as loud as you can because usually I'll say play this as loud as you can and they'll do it and I say play it louder and they'll do it and I'm like why didn't you play it that loud the first time you know what I mean? It's, it's yep. always, you know, showing them that they can go that extra 10%. Um, but I, I also want to make sure that they're, that I'm giving them things that their parents aren't going to discourage them from here. Because a lot of the times, you know, you have, you know, dad who is, you know, football captain and he's like, band is for nerds. And he, they're, they, the kid already lives with that kind of thing. Um, you know, or they're, they're like, oh, why do you, why does it sound so bad? What's your teacher teaching you? That kind of thing. That's, that's really common here. Um, so hmm. I'll give them, you know, that's that's one of the reasons that the, the solo books are so important for the younger kids in my studio because, you know, when, when grandma or mom or dad hears them play like, you know, the Avengers theme, they're like, oh, I know what that is. That sounds so good, blah, blah, blah. And then the kid is encouraged, you know, and not yeah. discouraged to practice. And then after they develop that, that, that strong sense of wanting to practice, then I go back and I say, okay, so let's refine these things. You know, when they actually have a little bit, you know, like their parent at least has an idea of like that I know what I'm talking about and that the kid is starting to sound good, they can trust me a little bit more. Um, that's that's a that's that's the main chunk of the bell curve. Usually, you know, there are sometimes I'll have a kid that the, the parents are like, we trust you, we've seen your bio, we know that you know what you're talking about, tell them to, you know, do whatever they need to do and we will make sure that we're telling them to do that at the house. And that's have like, you performed for the parents? I have not had the opportunity to do that in a long time. Yeah. But um, trying to find the facility that would allow me to, you know, let the kids congregate is is difficult. Yeah, that can always be a challenge. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's, you know, because I'm not going to do it in my living room. And my studio yeah. is too oh, big, sure, yeah. you know, and I don't have a piano who's going to play, you know, who's going to play for them, right? I'm just saying, you hit them with some of that Albright and they'll they'll know who they're who they're dealing well, with. Well, I'm not going to hit myself <laughs> with Albright. Okay, now I'll pull out some Andy Scott tear up some three letter word you know and uh, any day but that uh, all bright and me just we, we've we've but we butt heads i'm still in the process of you know ironing out a lot of stuff in that one so yeah yeah as and, but, i think people are for most of their lives you know <laughs> yeah you know i've actually uh i probably shouldn't say this publicly but i've never uh performed the albright i have had multiple teachers of mine tell me that you shouldn't until you're at least 30. So the way that I see it, I'm ahead of schedule because I'm huh. only 20, how old am I, 20, I'm turning 20, I'm 27 right now. So I'm, I've got two and a half years before, you know, that's on my checklist. Like you're 30, you should play upright. You know, I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm already starting to kind of prepare for some of the double tonguing and the, the mm -hmm. you know, I, I have, a, I have a little weight that I'm using on my pinky for that fourth movement E flat to C trill, you know? <laughs> So I'm, I'm already working up some strength for that. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, I, the show pieces for the parents, I, that's, that's a good suggestion. I, I need to figure out how I can get some facilities to, to do that. Maybe a local well, church or something. Yeah, and, and, and I think that any anything like that, uh, I actually, I push all, like anytime I post a video to YouTube of some performance I've recently done, or, or if I am performing anywhere locally, I'm always pushing that to the parents because um, I think it's important that they know that they're not they're they're not taking saxophone lessons from a band director. Um, yes. And 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 yeah. I know that sounds really almost like uh, that sounds like really like mean and sarcastic because obviously I'm not. But yeah, because they but see, a lot they of, see music teacher. Exactly. They don't, they don't see saxophonist and then band director. They don't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so for them to know that your 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 children your child is taking a lesson from a saxophonist who plays saxophone 
not to toot my own horn, but pretty well. And, you know, and is and is performing and is doing all these things to know that I'm an active musician, not just a teacher. Um, I think that that helps establish a lot of credibility. And then when you turn around and you say, yeah, your child's going to be making these terrible noises um, in your <laughs> in your house on their mouthpiece for a couple minutes every time they practice, they're more likely to be like, OK, I don't understand it, but you're the professional. So, OK, fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when was the last? I mean, I know you have a Tesla, so this is not a good uh, what I'm about to say. It probably doesn't apply to you, Mr. Hoity Toity. Um, but, you know, when was I can't I can't think of the last time I took my uh, my car to the mechanic and then like looked over their shoulder and said, why are you doing that? You know, uh-huh. no, they you know, they like, hey, my car is my car's making a clankety sound. Get rid of the clankety. And they're like, OK, whatever. And they fix it, and I'm like, "Hey, no clankity, thanks," you know. And uh, although well, I, I guess think that, I think that it's different than that, though. I mean, it's 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 a process. It's an evol- it's it's an evolving art, right? You know. Uh, for example, on the repair, I know where you're coming from from that, but I think that this is where the repair side of things for me, like my my playing and my repair, always keep each other in check in a very interesting way. You know, because the repair reminds me that the playing is an evolving art. Because, you know, I'm always paying attention to the tactile feel of the jobs that I produce. Because, you know, I know that there are going to be great players that are going to be feeling these. And they, whether they know it or not, are going to be judging the work that I put out. And I'm always thinking of like, okay, so what can I do better that would make them go not be able to find stuff? And I think that that can also be said about the way that I teach. Is there a is there a better way that I can do this? Is there a better way that I can play this? You know, so it's 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 a cycle. It, I guess it's one of the ways that I deal with my ADHD, right? It's like you know when I when I go off onto something else, whether it's like a saxophone that's on my bench, I want to know that 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 you know that that. I'm not doing something else that's not going to help me grow, right. right? And then when I go to saxophone and I start going, okay, what's the better way to do this? I'm always in a process or in a hobby that allows me to grow. Mm-hmm. So, and, and people sit over my shoulder and they go, why are you doing that to my horn? And it's like, well, <laughs> the last guy didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, yeah, there, there are little things like that too. Yeah, yeah. I understand that. So... All right, Reese. So, what are we gonna do on the uh, what are we gonna do on the next episode? High school. Uh, um, I don't know. Or is, that, or is that too broad? That might be a little too broad. I mean, we only did. Well, I guess we did kind of do like all of middle school. Because it's uh, there's not really a whole lot that you can do. I don't think I there's. Think that, for me, there's not a huge difference between like year one and year two. Like I mentioned earlier, right. I have like a whole checklist of things, and mm-hmm. nine times out of ten. Uh, Actually, I'll say I actually have a year three. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it because we have maybe just a, a, co- a little like a, a minute couple and minutes. a half. Minute and a half. Um, I have a year three, which involves harmonic minors. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And 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 as soon as we do the bum 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 bum, we switch to full range in eighth notes. And so by the you know in my perfect curriculum, by the time we get to high school. We're playing all 12 majors and minors, full range of the instrument in eighth notes. Because at that point, it's just the fun part, speeding it up. And, you know, that almost never happens. Um, I have, in my mind, three students who will accomplish that. Um, And so, yeah. So, I mean, the difference between year one and year two, not super huge because of all those boxes that we have to check. So, I don't know. Maybe next time we could just go to like maybe we could talk about the transition from middle school to high school what do you think okay i like that i like that yeah what what's different about about the expectations what's different about you know for for me anyway uh in in the area i teach and I'm, i'm fortunate to be able to talk to parents about uh instrument upgrades and how we can uh, ensure that we always have a working saxophone despite being in marching band. Yeah, <laughs> which I know is going to be a big thing for you, <laughs> being a yeah. repair tech. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that will be. I think we'll have a lot to talk about. 
and, and the next one. Yep. All right, man. That was good. I loved it. I loved all the information. Um, and it's interesting to know that a lot of the things are lining up a little bit more than I had originally thought. We'll see if it, if it keeps lining up in the middle school and high school era. Yes, we will. Very good stuff. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Reese. And we will see everybody maybe next week. Yeah, absolutely.